Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Canadian national stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Canadian National is a railroad freight company which serves Canada and the Midwestern and Southern US. Soon to be Mexico once they acquire an American company, which we're going to talk about later. The company is headquartered in Montreal, Quebec, Canada and was founded in 1919, over 100 years ago. It went public in 96 and trades on the New York Stock Exchange, TSX, Mexican Bolsa, Deutsche Bursa, and Ebovespa. It is Canada's largest railway in terms of revenue and the size of its rail network, spanning 20,400 miles of track. Bill Gates is the largest shareholder at 10%. Transporting goods is more cost efficient using railways than truck or plane. You can carry so much more on rail cars than you can on a truck. Also, it's a lot better for the environment. The fuel emissions are a lot less with rail cars than trucks. And rail cars are so much faster than trucks. Trucks have to stop at lights, they have traffic, they have to fill up gas, and a whole host of other things. Planes are a lot faster, but they're so much more expensive, and they can't carry nearly as much as rail cars. So rail cars are here to stay for a long time. Although Tesla does claim its electric trucks are cheaper than rail. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but it's going to take a long time to get companies to switch from rail car to truck. Let's get started with the model. We're going to look at the ticker that trades on the TSX. So all the numbers in this video are in Canadian dollars. This is a large cap company, 96 billion market cap. They're trading at 136 a share and they have 708 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. They have a lot of free cash flow from 2.4 billion up to 3.3 billion. Net income is a profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that drops from 4.3 billion to 3.5 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company. That peaked in 2019 at 15 billion. In a trailing 12 months at 13.8 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. An example is the cost of labor. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. That peaked in 2019 at 6.1 billion. It's currently 5.7 billion. I pulled this chart from Yahoo Finance. Their operating expenses are incorrect. Also their operating income. So we could ignore these two lines. They paid 545 million of interest on their debt which was higher than 2018 of 489 million. Below that is other income and expenses. If it's negative, it's usually an asset impairment. If it's positive, it's usually the gain on the sale of an asset. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which was high in 2018 and 19, a lot lower in 2020 and the trailing 12 months. That's mainly from other income and expenses. When I look at the income statement, I like to focus on operating income. But what I focus on most is cash flow from operations in the statement of cash flows. When we look at that later, you'll see how cash flow from operations is more relevant than net income. This is a breakdown of their revenue from the first quarter of 2021. So almost all their revenue is from freight deliveries. They received over $700 million of revenue from delivering grain and fertilizer, $660 million from petroleum and chemicals, their largest is from Intermodal, 968 million. Intermodal is a more efficient way to ship. It's when a rail car brings the products to a plane or when a ship brings the products to a rail car. It just means using different modes of transportation. About 72% of their revenue comes from Canada, the rest from the United States. This is their statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash. In 2020, they generated more cash flow than in 2019. Yet in 2020, their net income was a lot lower. That's because of the non-cash expenses. That large asset impairment 
Also, depreciation is another non-cash item that brings down their net income, but doesn't affect their operating cash flow. That's why I like to focus on operating cash flow. I feel that's a better indicator of a company's financial health than net income. And this company spends a good amount of money in CapEx, about two and a half to three and a half billion dollars a year. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they do have a lot of free cash flow, 2.4 billion up to 3.3 billion. They do pay a nice dividend, about $1.7 billion a year. They're also using free cash flow to buy back stock. They bought back $2 billion in 2018, $1.7 billion, then $400 million. Every time a company buys back capital stock, that decreases the shares outstanding, making your shares more valuable. They also add debt every year. They issued $3.3 billion in 2018, paid down $2.4 billion, so they added about $800 million. Then they added about 1.2 billion and half a billion. You may be wondering why does a company with so much free cash flow add debt each year? Debt is a really cheap way to finance your company because interest rates are so low. So companies like this are taking on a lot of debt to acquire other companies or to use that debt to buy back stock, pay a dividend or grow their business. Let's look at the capital structure. They have $20 billion of equity, $13 billion of debt. They're 60% equity, 40% debt. And their WAC is 7%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's $115 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $102 billion. We divide that by 708 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 145. They're trading at 136, so they're trading at a 6% discount. It is a buy according to the model, but it's really close. Simply Wall Street values the company at 125, so they're saying it's overvalued. They're saying it's a sell. 17 analysts price this stock, and this is referring to the stock that trades on the New York Stock Exchange. That's trading at 112 a share, and the average price target was 124, the low was 101, the high was 146. This is a stock price since it started trading, so you can see it's pretty much only gone up over time. It went up little by little for about 10-12 years, then for about 3 years the stock went up a lot faster. This is a stock price the last 12 months, so it looks like a roller coaster. It was trading at about 110 a share. And then the price was driven up to about 145 and then it was up and down for a while. Then the past few months, the price really dropped. A lot of people sold off and drove the price down to 125. It has come up to 136. They pay a 1.8% dividend yield and they raise their dividend each year. They were paying 38 cents a share in 2016. Now they're up to 62 cents. To calculate the dividend yield, you could just sum the last four dividend payments take that number and divide by the stock price. They pay out 49% of their net income and 53% of their free cash flow. And they pay a higher dividend than the industry average. The industry pays a 1.4% dividend, they're at 1.8%. And analysts are forecasting their dividend to grow to 2% in the next three years. And just recently they announced they were going to acquire KCS for $34 billion. They offer 20% more than Canadian Pacific, so they really wanted this company. Each shareholder for KCS, the ticker is KSU, will receive $200 in cash and a little over one share of Canadian national stock. CN said this will create a safer, faster, cleaner, and stronger railway. I think the main reason they wanted to acquire this company, they wanted a larger market share in the US and they wanted to be part of Mexico. When one company wins a bidding war, it is a good thing that you were able to acquire another company and grow your business, but that means you paid more than anyone else. Sometimes that could be a bad thing when you overpay, which I think they did in this case, but in the long term, I think they'll be fine. During an acquisition, the people that almost always benefit are the investors of the company that got acquired. This is KCS's stock price. So you can see it was trading at about $200 a share. Then when it was announced they may get acquired, their stock price was driven up to $300 a share. Because each shareholder knows it's going to receive $200 in cash and one share of Canadian national stock. Nothing changed with KCS from this point to this point. 
What I mean is that they didn't become more profitable. Between this time frame, they didn't bring in more revenue or bring in more profits. It was just announced they were going to get acquired and the value of the company grew 50%. It's kind of like when you have a job and if you make $50,000 a year and you wanna make more, but if you stay at that job, you only get an extra three or $4,000 each year. The only way to get a big increase is to leave the job and get an offer for say $70,000. Your skills didn't change. You didn't become smarter. You didn't get educated overnight. You just got an offer from another company. Now your value went from 50,000 to 70,000. Same thing with a company, nothing changed. They just got acquired by someone else. And that person is saying the value of them is higher. They have a pretty low beta, 0.63, so the stock is less volatile than the market. The stock has only gone up 11.6% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P 500 went up 31%. You also get that 1.8% dividend, but you would have been better off investing in the S&P 500 than this company the past 52 weeks. The 52-week low was 116, the high was 149. The stock is trading above its 50-day, but below its 200-day moving average. About 1.5 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 708 million shares outstanding, 606 million are on float, meaning they're available for investors like me and you to purchase. 76% of the shares are held by institutions and under 1% of the shares are shorted. If you include dividends, in the past year this stock has gone up 13%, its industry went up 27% and the market 36%. In the past three years, this stock has performed similar to the market, but underperformed its industry by a lot. In the past five years, this stock is up 96%, but its industry is up 136%, the market 61%. Analysts are forecasting their earnings to grow 8%, its industry 8%, and the market 14%. Analysts are forecasting their revenue to grow 6%, similar to its industry and the market. In the past five years, their annual earnings are flat. Its industry is up 10%, the market is up 13%. In the past year, their earnings are down 21%, its industry is up 11%, and the market is up 15%. But remember, their earnings are only down because of that asset impairment. Their cash flow is up. If you invested $10,000 in this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $35,000 today. That's a 13% annual return. That's a great investment. The biggest shareholder is Cascade Investment at 12%. That's Bill Gates' investment firm. The second biggest is MFS, one of the oldest asset managers in the world. This company is credited with pioneering the mutual fund. Next is Wellington, which has $1 trillion of assets under management. The next is Vanguard, the largest mutual fund with $6 trillion of assets under management. Then you have the Children's Investment Fund, which is a hedge fund in London. They focus on improving the lives of children living in poverty and undeveloped countries. It is one of the largest charities in the UK. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 33, the median is 22. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 27.3, so investors are paying $27 for $1 of earnings, which is between the market median and average, but value investors like to see a PE below 15. Their price to sales is 7.0, also between the market median and average. Price to book is 4.8. Their return on invested capital is 12.1%. It's good to see when you invest in a company, their ROIC is greater than their WAC, and it's graded by 5%. Their interest coverage ratio is 9.6, so they can cover the interest payments on their debt nine and a half times. They have a good ROE at 17.7%, much bigger than the market median average. They have a good current ratio at 1.2, so they can cover their current liabilities with their current assets. And their current assets are half a billion of cash, 1.2 billion of receivables, and 600 million of inventory. They do seem to be well capitalized. They had 3.3 billion of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, half a billion of working capital, working capital's current assets minus current liabilities, and they paid over $1.7 billion of dividend payments. So they have over $2 billion of funding. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos on Canadian Pacific, National Express, and Freight Car America. All in the same industry as CN, 
And if CN has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they're worse in all the price multiples, but they're pretty close in PE and price to book. But the two companies with an amazing price to sales of below one have negative earnings. So it doesn't mean much if you could bring in all the sales in the world, but you have so much expenses that you have negative earnings, which these two companies do. They have a good current ratio of 1.2. Their ROE is 18%, which is worse than Canadian Pacific. They're lowest in debt of all four companies, and they're the biggest company on this list at 96 billion market cap. CP is at 65 billion, and they do pay the highest dividend at 1.8%. CP is 0.78%. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 6% discount, but I think this stock is a really good long-term hold. They've been around over 100 years. There's no risk of them cutting their dividend. They seem to be doing a good job at growing their business. In order to grow as a rail car company, you really need to acquire another company. It's not like a company like Apple. They can just have a new version of their iPhone or even come out with a new product that their customer base will purchase or sell in other countries. It's hard to grow organically as a rail company. It's really hard to just lay down tracks and have it become profitable. This company is a really important part of Canada. They supply a lot of jobs there. They also supply a lot of jobs in America, soon to be more, and they'll be supplying jobs in Mexico. So I think this is a great company that has a good vision and a good business model. I rank their free cash flows 8 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratios 5 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.